It's time to eat. What are you hungry for? Sit down and get ready to consume an abundance of fantasy football knowledge from Ross Tucker and Joe Dolan. Feed me now. I'm starving. On the Fantasy Feast Eating Podcast. Yeah, let's eat, baby. This is the Fantasy Feast Eating Podcast presented, of course, by DraftKings. I'm Ross Tucker, former NFL offensive lineman. Most of you know that five teams, seven years, classic journeyman at Ross Tucker NFL is my social media. All of the network can be found at Ross Tucker pod. We post the clips of the various shows, the three or four best clips from each show we think are worthy. Highly encourage you to check out youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. More and more people enjoying watching the show. People sending me screenshots of watching on the big screen, which is scary because of how much I already fill up uh, this monitor with my head. Um, Wow, that's uh, very scary. At any rate, though, the other thing you should check out is Joe Dolan. And I got to tell you, this is, I would argue, and Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, I would argue this is one of the most important episodes we do every year. Wes Huber, our draft guy, is at the Combine. So we'll yeah, he's probably literally there. Up. Yeah, he's literally there. Getting all so the information. We'll, so. Yeah, so we'll probably pick it up next week with the wide receivers. We did quarterbacks last week. That was excellent. Speaking of wide receivers, by the way, Greg Cosell, We'll be on tomorrow's Ross Tucker football podcast to discuss the wide receivers. And our guy grades, Sean Grady, was incredible on the Even Money podcast yesterday going over all of the bets from Steve Fezzik and I all year. So we'll get back into the prospects. But I would argue maybe even more important in terms of your fantasy success in 2022 then the rookie rankings is really diving into some of the coaching changes whether that's the head coach or the offensive coordinator joe i think this is an undervalued aspect of fantasy football that makes a really big difference in how people have success or not certain guys have certain track records of success or they come from systems that clearly feature a certain position or are more likely to have a bell cow running back versus a committee. I mean, there's a lot there, Joe. Yeah. So uh, Ross, one thing that I think you want to look at coaching changes from is from like a big picture perspective. What, what is the philosophy of this coach? What is his background? Because I don't think we're going to be able to know the micro. And I think you can analyze a little too much. Uh, I don't think we're going to be able to know the micro until we really get into the weeds of analyzing what the coaches do. And I've started to notice, you know, a lot of times coaches, because of the sh- the shortened off season program, the fewer padded practices that they are allowed, sometimes they don't even know until they're in the weeds of the season it what kind of player what kind of players they have what kind of players are going to going to work out let's throw it to for instance um a, a team that had a new coach this year in our, in uh, Atlanta with Arthur Smith they came out this year thinking Mike Davis is going to be our lead back and we're going to use Cordero Patterson as an ancillary player that completely flipped after just a couple of weeks during the season when Smith saw what he had but it is good to go in and understand what a coach's philosophy is, what a what a play caller's tendencies are, just to get kind of a little bit of a background. And Ross, we have, I, I believe, 12 new play callers uh, in the NFL. We're obviously not going to be able to get to them all today, but we can start today with some of the play callers uh, in the league and try to get a little bit of a grasp on what we might see from these offenses. Yeah, I love it. Um, I should have mentioned right away, but he is the fantasy gangster at FG underscore Dolan on social media. 21 feast is the code you absolutely have to use when you go to fantasypoints.com. 21 feast. That is the code specifically for this show. Although 
Joe, that should be changing, right? We got we got to think about. Yeah, we'll get we'll get a change. It still works right now, but Ross, that's a good point. I'll throw that out there to our guy Kukanis, and he'll get working on that. Okay, yeah, we should change that because it's a new year. Um, great point about the big picture, and you're right, Joe. A lot of times they don't know what they have until it's a few weeks into the season. So we can make big proclamations, but if they don't know. We sure as heck aren't going to know what really matters, Joe. Is it the head coach or is it just the play caller? I think both matter. Um, the head coach, more so if he's an offensive guy. Uh, play caller, obviously, if the head coach is more of a CEO, defensive guy kind of thing. You know, like, um, I, well, I don't think we're, we're not going to be uh, – well, actually, we are talking Carolina today. So, Ben McAdoo, who's the offensive coordinator there, is going to be very important. Um, uh, why, whereas Doug Peterson in, in Jacksonville, who's the new head coach is going to be the more important guy. It's about really who's going to be calling the plays, but you know, the head coach is going to set the philosophy. Um, yeah, to- totally. So let's get to, uh, who do you want to start with Joe? Let's start with Doug Peterson. Yeah. Let's start with Peterson. Um, and he's in Jacksonville Ross and you know, for the second time in his career, Doug Peterson is essentially being asked to clean up a mess left behind by a former stud college coach who was in over his head in the NFL. Obviously, the first being Chip Kelly in Philadelphia, and then the second, of course, being Urban Meyer. The difference here is Chip Kelly at least had some modicum of success. He he, he actually fielded an NFL-caliber team until his players got sick of him. Urban Meyer's players got sick of him quicker, and he didn't field an NFL-caliber team. So now we're looking at a much bigger mess for Doug Peterson uh, to clean up. But to borrow from Tupac Shakur, there is a rose that grew from concrete here, and it is Trevor Lawrence. And I understand that Trevor Lawrence did not have a great rookie season, but he was the consensus number one pick in the draft, and every quarterback needy team in the league would trade for him right now. And Doug Peterson developed Carson Wentz into an MVP candidate. We know what happened there. I think a lot of that is on Wentz and his ego or whatever went wrong in Philadelphia, the injuries. But he brilliantly coached Nick Foles to a Super Bowl championship. Doug Peterson has shown the adaptability to play with multiple kinds of quarterbacks. You know, he even changed his offense late in his ill-fated 2020 season with Philadelphia to adapt to Jalen Hurts. So let's let's go into the Peterson file here. Uh, Number one. Jeffrey Lurie, when the Eagles hired Doug Peterson, said he had an emotional intelligence, which was obviously a shot at Chip Kelly. But it was a a, a signifier from Lurie that he thought Doug Peterson had the personality to bring a fractured locker room together. That is obviously going to be majorly important in Jacksonville after the Urban Meyer disaster. But let's get to let's get to Doug Peterson's philosophy. Well, it comes from the Andy Reid school, of course. He's a former quarterback. He believes in the old adages, throw to get ahead, run to keep the lead. And I think that's exactly what he's going to do. But in order to keep Trevor Lawrence clean and get him in a position where he can throw to get ahead, they have got to fix the offensive line. And this is where it all comes back into draft talk, Ross. I don't know how many of the draft prospects you've looked at here on the offensive line, but I personally would be shocked if the Jaguars didn't spend their first pick, whether they trade the number one overall pick or keep it where they stand, I would be shocked if they didn't spend that on an offensive tackle. I don't know about you, but I would be shocked if they didn't spend it on a tackle. Uh, Agreed. I think that they let Cam Robinson go in free agency and their first round pick is an offensive tackle. You know, it's funny too, because Cam Robinson might end up getting decent money from somewhere else because he's a starting left tackle. But I think the Jags think they can get better play from somebody a lot cheaper. And that's the one Cam thing that, that, right. And that's the one thing that Doug Peterson inherited from Chip Kelly. They had a good offensive line. They had an offensive line that had Jason Peters, Lane Johnson, and Jason Kelsey all on it. Now, the Eagles have done a great job resupplying that offensive line with draft picks and free agent signings, but he inherited an offensive line that had three anchors and three potential future Hall of Famers all on it. Jacksonville does not have that, but they've got to start by building that. What he does have, though, he didn't have in Philly was the quarterback. What he does have in Jacksonville is the quarterback. Now, one thing to keep in mind if you're looking for fantasy, two things, actually. Number one, Doug Peterson used a very active running back rotation in Philadelphia. I think it's very possible both James Robinson and Travis Etienne, if he comes off 
the uh, the Liz Frank surgery are both fantasy relevant in 2022. Remember, when the Eagles won the Super Bowl, they had a very active three-man running back rotation. LeGarrette Blount, Jay Ajayi, and Corey Clement. Corey Clement actually had 100 yards receiving in the Super Bowl. So Travis Etienne, those receiving skills are going to come into play. Number two, the Jaguars, I would think, especially to help the offensive line early on, two tight end sets per sharp football stats. Doug Peterson's Eagles led the NFL in two tight end set percentage in each of his last three years. This is as far back as they go. Each of his last three years as Eagles head coach. And I mean, I have to imagine he was at or near the top in each of his first two years as well with Zach Ertz and Brent Selleck. So Dan Arnold, that talented receiving tight end, I think he's got a shot to be, really be on the rise here with Jacksonville. Don't be surprised if Jacksonville looks to spend up, get themselves another young tight end in the draft, or spend up in free agency to really um, to really live by Doug Peterson's philosophies. Feeling pretty good about Travis Etienne. Feeling much better about... Look, I'm feeling better about this entire offense, okay? Urban Meyer was a da- disaster. But I think this is good news for, for Tre- Trevor Lawrence. I think it's good news for Etienne, barring uh, the injury recovery. And I think it's good news for Dan Arnold. Wow. All right. I can see it about Dan Arnold for sure. And I, I agree with you. I, I think Peterson... The Jags are one of those – now, I'll tell you one thing. I don't know. Do you ever look at this, Joe? Jags only have seven home games out of 17 games. They are this year's Falcons. So they have – Does, so does right. that affect you or not really? I mean, I don't think they're going to be very good anyway, but it doesn't – I mean, they go to London every year. At this point, you would think they're used to it. But So, yeah, so what you're saying is they have the international game as one of their home games, but because of the schedule, this is one of their nine road game years. Oh, that is pretty brutal. All right, let's get to the Denver Broncos. Okay, so go ahead. Yeah, sorry, uh, Ross. Nathaniel Hackett's the new head coach here. Um, By the way, if you take a look at Nathaniel Hackett in like some photos when he's smiling, he kind of looks like Lane Kiffin. I don't know. That's uh, I don't know. You know what, Joe? Before you dive more into Hackett, I just realized I got to get a I got to get a quick commercial in real oh, quick. Oh, for sure. After the Lane Kiffin reference. <laughs> nice yeah, take it, take it, you know, Lane Kiffin looks pretty young, probably because he started taking athletic greens. Because athletic greens, look, for me, I can tell you, I wanted better gut health, and I would rather drink my greens than eat them or take pills. So that's why I started. It actually tastes pretty good. Like as far as like something that's drinking your greens that has 75 High quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, adaptogens. It tastes about as good as that can taste. Like I don't, I don't mind it at all. And the founder had an, a history of gut health issues, so he was like, "I got to start doing this." And now, every I can't tell you how many people I've talked to that do it now to make it easy, including me. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D, and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash feast. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash feast to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right, Joe, we're back at it with Nathaniel Hackett, the uh, older, a little bit, Thicker, uh, Lane Kiffin. Yeah, uh, and, and Balder. Uh, but hey, hey, you got you got to rock that dough. Maybe he should get on keeps rocks. Uh, in, in, nice. In, if he doesn't like the uh, if he doesn't like the bald dome, but no, he's forty two. I mean, hey, look, I'm getting there, man. I'm thirty five turn thirty six this year. Like, uh, there's a tweet out there, Ross. Um, uh, I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, it's a tweet that says, um, it says like. Me saying to myself, I'm 35. I have my whole life ahead of me. And then right after that, they they uh, juxtapose that with a TV sports announcer. Here comes the oldest player in the league. He's 32, a medical miracle. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's uh, sometimes uh, you got to get, get a little humor when we think of these running backs. And you're like, oh, my God, he's 28. Like, oh, he is decrepit. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> when, I, when I was 28, I was still figuring out my life. But anyway, Nathaniel Hackett, 42 years old. Oh, since Peyton Manning retired, the Denver Broncos have averaged the fourth f- 
fewest points in the National Football League. And the only three teams worse are pretty easy to guess, Ross. Can you name can you name two of them? New Since York 20, Giants. That's one of them. Uh New York Jets. That's two of them. So say it again. How many people teams that three have averaged less points? Fewer than, than the, Broncos. the Broncos since Peyton Manning retired. Less points. Yeah. You got you got two of them. The Giants and the Jets. I'm gonna go Jaguars. You nailed it. All three. The <laughs> team we just talked about. So way to way to go, Ross. So the Broncos have been down bad since Peyton Manning retired. So obviously. This Nathaniel Hackett conversation is going to change if they go out and get Aaron Rodgers. We don't know that right now. Um, but for the sake of the, for the sake of argument here, let's just assume they have to put another Band-Aid on the quarterback position the way they've been doing since Peyton retired. Um, and look at what Nathaniel Hackett's going to do. Number one, he said they're going to run an outside zone scheme. All right, Javante Williams to the moon. However, George Peyton, the general manager, said – Yesterday at the NFL Combine, we want to bring Melvin Gordon back. Boo. Not Nothing against Melvin Gordon, who had a great season. But from a fantasy perspective, we want Javante Williams to be that lead back. Nonetheless, I think the new uh, offense will suit Javante Williams extremely well. Um, uh, I, the Broncos, by the way, ran some of the fewest RPOs in the NFL. They will not do that under Nathaniel Hackett. They will run plenty of RPOs. The problem is they've got to get the right trigger man. Uh, Nathaniel Hackett, here's one thing that's going to have to change, and perhaps this is simply a Packers thing. The Packers ran uh, below or at the league average in each of his last five seasons as offensive coordinator, uh, both with the Packers and the Jaguars, by the way. Um, so I think part of that is probably personnel, but the but the Broncos, you would have to think, with Jerry, Judy, Cortland Sutton, and Tim Patrick are going to be a team that they want to run a lot of 11 personnel. So that's going to be fascinating to see. And one more thing, Noah Fant, the Broncos say they want to keep him there, but he's been kind of disappointing for fantasy. Well, in Hackett's three seasons as the Packers offensive coordinator, their tight ends were targeted at the eighth worst rate in the NFL. So something to keep in mind as we look at the Denver Broncos. But of course, the quarterback position is going to, is going to go above and beyond all of that. They are certainly looking to make a big splash in that area. Yeah, that uh, that's interesting about Melvin Gordon, by the way. Very yeah. interesting. They people like uh, coaches love him. Yeah, yeah. He he runs hard. He I think he's a great teammate. You know, he he catches the ball. Um, I think they trust him in pass pro. He does the things coaches love. It's just from a fantasy perspective. I almost felt bad, quite frankly, because he actually tweeted one once this year, like, yo, fantasy guys, I know you don't want me here, but we love this, we love this relationship. And I felt bad. I'm like, because like this isn't even a guy who was having a bad season. Like he was having a good season and people were frankly annoyed that he was having a good season because they wanted Javante Williams to be getting the football. Um, but like, you're right. That's a guy coaches love. I think a lot of teams feel like they need two good backs on their roster these days. And Melvin Gordon, Gordon still certainly fits that bill. He definitely does. Uh, let's talk a little Kenny Dorsey. Mm -hmm. Sticking around in Buffalo. Now, I wouldn't think that the Buffalo Bills are going to change a whole lot um, from what they've done. The one thing that is good, though, Ross, and this might have just been kind of an organizational thing or a just like we need to protect Josh Allen more, is how good Devin Singletary was down the stretch. And they finally had a meaningful part of their run game. And sometimes... You know, I look at this from maybe sometimes coaches overthink it. Like the Bronx, the, the the Bills were so content on being a pass first team that rotated in multiple backs that maybe they just figured out, you know, let's just give one guy the ball and see what happens. And all of a sudden, Devin Singletary was their lead back. But Ken Dorsey, I don't think we're going to see a whole lot of changes for Buffalo's offense. They finished with top three scoring offenses, top five total offenses, top 10 passing games in each of the last two seasons. And of course, um, uh, Ken Dorsey's been the quarterback's coach there for three years. Um, Joe Brady's the new quarterback's coach, which is actually interesting. Um, but Josh Allen essentially said, Ken Dorsey, he wouldn't be the player he is now, if not for uh, Ken Dorsey. Um, uh, here's a quote, quote, 
his career definitely changed once Dorsey started coaching him in 2019. Obviously, 2018 was Allen's rookie season, and then he exploded in 2020. So this is a guy who's got a great relationship with Josh Allen, knows the offense inside and out. I would anticipate more of the same philosophically from the Buffalo Bills. From a play-calling perspective, we're not going to be able to know that. Because Ken Dorsey has never called plays in the NFL. He doesn't have it. I don't think he even has play calling experience in college, but he obviously knows this offense inside and out. We're going to have to wait until week one to see what kind of play calling is going to happen. But this is a, if it ain't broke, don't fix it move by the Buffalo Bills, promoting Ken Dorsey from quarterbacks coach and passing game coordinator to offensive coordinator. So while we're on that, let's go to New York with the Giants and Brian Dayball Mm -hmm. And, you know, now they're talking about open to trading Saquon. What what impact do you think Dayball has on, on that offense in New York? Um, I mean, an overwhelmingly positive one. I, just because the Giants have been such a disaster the last couple of years. And, you know, you would think Brian Dayball's coaching, based on how he coached Josh Allen – Skill set wise, Daniel Jones is a very, very, very poor man's version of Josh Allen. He's not as big. He's not as strong. He's not as fast. He doesn't doesn't have as good of an arm. But in theory, he can do some of the same things. Now, you would the, the problem is they've got to get the receivers healthy. They've got to get receivers who can catch the football. But in theory, Kenny Galladay, Sterling Shepard, who's coming off a serious injury. Canarius Tony, who couldn't stay on the field for more than five plays at a time this year, is a receiving core that Brian Dable can work with. But with the, when it comes to the Giants, I am fascinated, Ross, because, look, if they think they can get something for Saquon Barkley, now is the time. I, I mean, what if, what if your, your offensive line stinks again next year? He gets hurt again. I don't know. Um, I know you're selling low, but it feels like a contending team, ironically, maybe Buffalo would be somebody who could trade for Saquon Barkley, a team looking for that piece to take them over the top. I, I, I think it's fascinating from that perspective, Ross, but um, I think Brian Dable's going to have a positive impact on the Giants' offense. But the the whispers from Giants beat reporters are that they are not going to pick up the fifth-year option on Daniel Jones. And look, if you think your guy really has a shot to be the guy, you're going to pick up that option. Hell, Sam Darnold got his picked up. So uh, that that really indicates to me that Brian Dable came, came in there. The new general manager came in there and were like, mm, not too sure about this guy. And remember, they have two first-round picks this year. Well, not only that, though, I just don't think it makes that much sense. You don't want to be in the situation the Panthers are. Exactly. And like, maybe- if, if, if Daniel Jones is amazing this year, that's a good problem to have. And – you franchise tag him or you get a long-term deal done, but you don't want to be obligated to him if he I mean, doesn't look have at a the good Panthers deal. right now. I mean, like Sam Darnold, he's under contract. What, Roth? What is it? 19 million, 18, 19 million? It's a unbelievable. Disaster. Unbelievable. Disaster. Speaking of unbelievable, how about this? DraftKings, the leading sports book app, is here to help you and your friends get in the game with different ways to fund your DraftKings account. You can fund your DraftKings account with cash now. Just sign up in the DraftKings Sportsbook app, select Fund with Cash in the payment section, and get a digital barcode. Then just take your cash and barcode to any one of their thousands of participating stores. Super easy. And while you're there, why not pick up some DraftKings gift cards? Don't know what to get your buddy for his birthday? Bang, DraftKings gift card. Want to say thanks to the neighbor who helped you carry a sofa up the steps? DraftKings gift card. How about a Father's Day present? Maybe to yourself. DraftKings gift card. Done and done. Just visit DraftKingsGiftCard.com to find a participating store near you. March is here. Get in the game with these two awesome, fun, and easy account funding options. Joe, Let's talk about the former Giants head coach. Yeah. That is your buddy, Ben McAdoo, down in Carolina. Is this the splash hire that Matt Rule reportedly needed? Um, I mean, 
They they said uh what was the Jay Glazer said he thinks Matt Rule needed to make a rock star hire at offensive coordinator. Well, I mean, in a way he did because you you remember Ben McAdoo Ross, I'm sure you've got a tailor, right? You're on TV a lot. You've got a tailor, don't you? Kind of, yeah. Yeah, kind of. Well, at least kind is better than what Ben McAdoo had. The guys out there at his Giants introductory press conference looking like David Byrne wearing an oversized suit. Um, and he got off on the wrong foot with the Giants. But honestly, kind of when you look back at it, the Giants offense wasn't all that bad with Ben McAdoo at the helm. Now, things went sour and, and fully admit he handled it poorly when he benched Eli Manning. Eli Manning's play was slipping, but like, you bench him for Geno Smith. It's not even like they, they benched him for Daniel Jones, who had a shot to be the quarterback of the future. No, you benched him for a dead-end guy in Geno Smith, okay? Um, that's how it ended poorly. But they actually ended up having def- decent offenses. Um, the Giants ran the eighth most plays per game uh, uh, from 2014 to 2017. So they had a lot of plays. They led the NFL in 11 personnel usage during McAdoo's four-year run. Um, Odell Beckham became a star during Ben McAdoo's run. So obviously you've got a, a guy here who can at least coach some offense. Now the big problem is say what you want about Eli Manning at the tail end of his career. He was at least a competent quarterback for a good part of that time. The Panthers don't have one of those right now. Um, but I have to admit, I'm feeling pretty optimistic about DJ Moore um, in Ben McAdoo's offense. Um, obviously you have Robbie Anderson there, but if, if, I mean, if there is an opportunity for a young player who had a great preseason last year to step up and make, take a step forward, uh, Terrace Marshall, he had a great preseason last year. He actually had more receiving yards in the preseason than he did during the regular season. He disappeared during the regular season, but maybe he's one of those second year receivers who was getting, he was getting like ninth, 10th round hype in best ball drafts last summer who's going to be going towards the last round this year because he didn't do anything as a rookie. Maybe that's somebody who you can pick up and say, the new offense under Ben McAdoo is going to take a step forward. Therefore, you know, Terrace Marshall's somebody we're going to give another shot to this year. Um, there's a lot more to say about Ben McAdoo, but I mean, um, that, that that's kind of the, the, the long and the short of it. The problem is the quarterback position is a disaster because Sam Darnold stinks. We know Sam Darnold stinks, and they are tied to his contract. Luke Getzey. What do we need to know about Luke Getze in Chicago? So he is the new offensive coordinator for uh, for the Bears and Matt Eberflus. Eberflus! Um, uh, Ross, you know where uh, Luke Getze's called plays before? Akron. The in, uh, uh, Indiana University of Pennsylvania. IUP, baby! He called plays there from 2011 to 22. Um Getzy is, uh, I mean, he l- learned from two creative play callers. Uh, he's worked under Matt LaFleur, and he's worked under Joe Moorhead. Joe Moorhead, you remember? Yep. Penn State. He mentored him at, uh, at, at uh, Mississippi State. So he's learned from two really creative coaches, and it's going to be interesting to see him try to marry those things. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of RPOs here. I think there's going to be a lot of RPOs with Justin Fields at quarterback taking advantage of his skill set. Now, I think this is this is why this is a fascinating hire because Luke Getze comes from the Joe Moorhead school. Joe Moorhead, mobile quarterback, RPOs. He's the new head coach at Akron, but you remember him uh, most famously as the offensive coordinator at Penn State, the head coach at Mississippi State, and the offensive coordinator at Oregon. RPO heavy, you know, make things easy on the quarterback. I think this is a very positive offense here for Justin Fields. It's going to simplify the decision-making. We had a coach in Matt Nagy who simply did not take advantage of the mobility of either Mitchell Trubisky, really, or Justin Fields. He had Justin Fields dropping back a ton and getting sacked behind a bad offensive line and Fields not really recognizing things. The idea for Getze is to come in, come behind the scenes here, work with Justin Fields, simplify that decision-making process. I think this is good news for Justin Fields. I think it's good news for the run game. Um, they said, look, I think our run game's in good shape with David Montgomery, and I think it's good news for Darnell Mooney with Allen Robinson expected to move on in free agency. So here's what else is good news. 
It's very easy to follow Joe on social media at FG underscore Dolan. We might even have a part two of this podcast at some point. If there's some other coordinators we feel like we should discuss, fantasypoints.com is the place to be. We'll get you a new code uh, starting next week. Can't wait to hear Wes Huber's wide receiver rankings after the combine. Other than that, I'm stuffed. We're done. Thanks for listening to the Fantasy Feast podcast. Make sure to also subscribe to the Ross Tucker football podcast, Even Money, Business of Sports, and the College Draft. All available at Apple Podcasts, RossTucker.com, or wherever podcasts can be found. A lot of times on the show, I mention DraftKings. Here's what you need to know. You got to be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 100Gambler or in Indiana, 109 with it. By the way, if what I was talking about included a deposit bonus, doesn't always, sometimes it does. Deposit bonus requires 25 times playthrough, and deposit bonuses are paid out in site credit.